first I want to begin by saying what a pleasure it is to be part of the Alto University faculty. Um, Diane and I moved here in June and have never looked back. It is where we are supposed to be and we really are enjoying being here. Um, the topic is consumer ethnography. Ethnographic research was pioneered in the early 20th century in the field of cultural anthropology. It generally entailed a white Westerner going to a relatively exotic location, living among the natives for a year or more, learning their language, participating in their life activities and rituals, observing from a quasi-insider perspective, interviewing people extensively, taking reams of notes, and then writing a monograph that explained his understanding of their native world, its guiding knowledge and beliefs, its values, its meanings, its activities, both sacred and profane. Nowadays, the context of ethnographic research may be tribes in the suburbs of America or downtown Helsinki, the favelas of Rio de Janeiro or the offices of Intel or Nokia. From an academic standpoint, ethnography has made some substantial contributions to our understanding of consumer behavior and consumer society. For example, in 1990, no one had ever examined or studied the phenomenon of consumption subcultures and the importance in general of products and brands as focal points for social organizing. There were chapters in textbooks about ethnic subcultures. You could read how you need to have certain kinds of foods for Jews on certain holidays, but there was nothing written about social groups or subcultures that organized around a particular activity or passion or product category. Seeing that as a gaping hole in the literature, Jim McAlexander and I began a multi-year ethnography of American Harley Davidson owners. We learned to ride, we bought Harleys, we made them our primary means of transportation, and we began the long process of embedding ourselves deeper and deeper into that subculture. We joined clubs. We attended rallies. I grew my hair long and sported a full beard. I did solo trips across country, observing how people in different places responded to me. We conducted formal depth interviews with dozens of writers, dealers, and corporate employees and we did informal interviews in bars, cafes, parking lots, and rally sites with many dozens more. The resulting article opened up a major stream of consumer research around subcultures, brand communities, and consumer tribes, and it remains a primer on consumer ethnography. For businesses, Ethnographic consumer research has led to strategies or insights that have transformed marketing strategy. For example, ethnography has allowed us to understand the nature of brand communities, how they form, and what they contribute to a company in terms of customer loyalty, creativity, and profitability. Today, companies like Intel and IBM have full-time ethnographers on staff to help them better understand how their products and services fit into the larger contexts of their customers' lives and businesses. In industries from consumer products to automotive to high technology, ethnography is a lifeline to a changing marketplace. Context isn't everything in consumer behavior, but it matters a lot. If you could get people to fill out a questionnaire with hundreds, even thousands of items, you still couldn't achieve the same level of understanding about them as if you spent a few hours 
with them, observing them, and interviewing them in the context <coughs> of their daily lives. For one reason, a survey can't reveal anything outside the logic of the survey itself. You can only get answers to the questions you thought to ask, and then only in the language in which you thought to ask them. Even focus groups, the meat and potatoes of managers who want to hear the voice of the customer, can be misleading, largely because of their lack of context. Imagine someone brings you a big bag of loose puzzle pieces and assures you that if you can put them together, the picture they form will reveal answers to your most burning questions. You'd want to assemble it, wouldn't you? Ethnographic research is about gathering and assembling the pieces of a complex jigsaw puzzle. But I do need to point out some key differences. First, with a jigsaw puzzle, all the pieces come in a nice box. In ethnographic research, the data pieces aren't handed to you. You have to go out and find them. Each piece is a story, a statement, or an observation. There may be hundreds of them, and they may be scattered all over the place, in people's homes, in their closets, drawers, and cupboards, in their cars, in their workplaces, in their conversations, in their minds. You get the pieces through a combination of observation and depth interview. The second difference, some of the data will be displayed publicly, like a biker's motorcycle and riding gear, or a conversation in a bar. Other pieces are hidden from view, like the biker's relationships at home or work, or the chinks in his or her self-confidence. For these pieces, you have to dig, but they tend to be fragile. So in digging for them, it's possible to mangle them beyond recognition. The digging is a delicate operation that requires rapport, sensitivity, and great care. Third, getting the right pieces is a function of sampling. You need to sample broadly within your context to make sure you get the whole picture and not just a corner of it. And even with the best emerging sam emergent sampling techniques, you probably end up with some missing pieces and other pieces that don't seem to belong. Fourth, with a jigsaw puzzle, you have a picture of the finished puzzle to work from. You know what you're building from the start. Imagine if you didn't. In ethnography, you don't start with a picture. You have to begin building and let the picture emerge from the process. Finally, and this part is hard for some scientists with a positivist orientation to understand or appreciate, two ethnographers working with the same puzzle pieces are likely to end up with different pictures. And both will be correct. And neither will be correct because they'll both be still pictures of a moving phenomenon. There's a great deal of consensus around the method for assembling a jigsaw puzzle. First, you find the corners and the edge pieces. It's relatively simple. Those pieces have nice straight edges. In ethnographic work, this translates to establishing the boundaries of the phenomenon you're studying. You do this by sampling broadly enough to capture the full range of possible experiences and behaviors. Next, most puzzle builders do a rough sort of the puzzle pieces into groups with similar colors and patterns. You may see things that look like sky or bits and pieces that look like a field or part of a building. In ethnography, we're looking for similarities and differences in how people live, how they understand and explain their lives. Some pieces of data may relate to self-concept, others to social relations, still others to meaningful lifestyles or activities. And on each of those dimensions, we'll see patterns of similarity and difference. 
some pieces of a jigsaw puzzle are especially distinctive, often because they contain segments of some unifying line, the edge of a building, the ironwork of a bridge, the trunk of a tree. In ethnographic data, we seek threads of continuity. They allow us to see how people organize and give meaning to their experiences. They may be core values or deep aspirations, things that form the core logics of people's material lives. Overlaying those superstructures, we find layers of mundane material practices, the kinds of daily performances that are learned or inherited almost without thinking. In, the, in this construction, we find the main explanatory themes of our study, or if you will, the foreground objects of our puzzle's emerging picture. Lastly, we fill in the background, using those pieces that in the beginning looked almost impossible to distinguish. We feel compelled to do this, even though the main picture is already formed. As ethnographers, we do it because we know that context matters. A boy holding a fishing pole at the edge of a lake is one thing. A boy holding a fishing pole at the edge of a drying mud flat means something else altogether. This is a practical question and a personal question. Why ethnography? Why consumer ethnography? Why not medicine? I was on that path as an undergraduate. I was making the necessary grades in the sciences. The short answer is that the practice of medicine began to seem stale and routine to me even before I began. In the interim, I felt like I'd found my calling as a writer. So why not a writer? Poetry and fiction were my passion. And to be clear, I never gave them up. I just gave up on the idea of making a living at them. I eventually discovered consumer ethnography as the end result of a string of happy accidents, which is another story for another time. For now, I'd like to finish with my explanation of what makes consumer ethnography meaningful to me as a discipline and as a personal pursuit. Ethnography provides a rich textured understanding of consumption in all its forms. This is especially important because consumption in the aggregate is what drives economies. The ways in which economies support consumption has, as Diane's presentation showed, deep implications for the health of the earth and the future of humanity. Our systems of consumption and production are dangerously out of balance and you can't fix what you don't understand. At the level of business and marketing, understanding consumption is one of the keys to success, not only financial success, but also, and more importantly, success as partners in building a more sustainable and equitable society. present situation perhaps excluded, people are fascinating. They're creative, they're surprising. Some of them on the surface are more creative and more surprising than others. But in my experience, there are no uninteresting people, only ones we haven't taken the time to get to know. Consumer ethnography appeals to the writer in me. As a research method, it opens up windows on people's lives the really interesting places in people's lives. I believe theory matters. Theories are stories that we create about how things work. They're the lenses through which we view problems and strategize solutions. I believe the best theories come about human experience and human behavior come from a foundation in real face-to-face -face engagement with humans. We need to hear their stories. We need to see where and how they live and work and play. We need to empathize with their pain, their joys, their hopes and their fears. For me, this is what ethnography is all about.
Because it's grounded in lived experience, ethnography also forms a solid foundation for other kinds of research. From its insights, we can build better surveys, create better models, conduct better, more valid experiments. And because life and its varied contexts are ever-changing, we need ethnography always to be in the thick of it. And to finish, my dream growing up was not to be a professor in a business school. I've always been way too much of a romantic for that. As a boy, I wanted to be James Bond. His life was exciting, glamorous. He used courage and wit to solve mysteries, save the world from disaster, and in the end, wind up with the pretty girl. Not bad, but not, as it turned out, very practical. Indiana Jones also inspired me, by the way. He was smart, adventurous, always living for the next great discovery. For me, ethnography provides some of the elements of romance and discovery that make life interesting. We choose our science based on our talents, our own sensibilities, and our own desires to contribute to society. For me, social science is one part fact-finding, one part puzzle building, one part crusade, and one part telling a good story. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. <laughs>